Hey everybody, I'm Chris Friesen from the LLP Archive. My friend Paul and I are bringing to you episode one, Ring Modulation Nation. We'll be using a David King fretless bass, the Moog MF-102, through a Mark Bass Tube 800 and out an Eden 210 cabinet. There are a number of segments covering different settings, tuning the pedal to different keys, looking at the geometry of the sound that the pedal is producing, and there are also some documents you will find useful. Uh, I'll have links everything for you in the information station below me. I hope you enjoy. Okay, here's the MF-102. We've got two different sections, the LFO and the modulator. Um, and this is the drive. Even when you have this bypass, this is going to affect it. You can boost it to get a mild distortion, but it's not what I'm going to demo to you. Um, so to get any modulation at all, you're going to have to move this mix pedal, or this mix knob up, and that'll determine the potency of it. And if you want to engage the LFO, you've got to use the amount knob. Um, so right now, the LFO is disengaged, and we're going to bring the mix up and make sure that we have it on a low setting. Uh, what we're going to discuss is tremolo. Now, our human ears can pick up um, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So, like anything below the 20 mark is going to have a tremolo effect, and we can hear a bit of that. And this is going to give you a sense of rate. And again, you can take it up to the point that that's all that you're hearing and the bass is kind of in the back. Now where this gets interesting is you can have a dynamic tremolo in the sense that you can use the LFO to, en to engage uh, the frequency and it's going to be dynamic in the sense that it shifts, it's not going to be a constant rate. So what you're hearing is the rate knob is moving the frequency back and forth this amount, which happens to be maxed out right now, in the shape of a square wave. Now you can make it a little more subtle by engaging the sine wave. So there's a couple of different types of tremolo that you can use. What I've found is that rather than trying to use the frequency knob to create a sense of sync or tempo with the band, that the rate gives more of that sensation. Because it like resets with, with the wave. So after tremolo, you kind of get into this growl state where you start to really hear it kind of feeding back on itself. And there, you get a sense of t in tuneness. It's almost there. There you go. So what I've tuned is it to an open A uh, with a harmonic at the 12th fret. And so you can start to use this as a sense of like key. Um, say we're playing an A, the A's are going to be more consonant than the rest of the scale. Or say we're playing in the key of G, so now your tonic sounds out of tune, but the two is nice and you can move all the way through your keys. So now the three is in tune. So when you're trying to disorient the listener or it, like it muffle the one, like this is a great way to go about choosing how you're keeping your key. Um, so experiment with different chord tones. Say you're playing an F minor, you can tune it to the third or the fifth and the seventh and get a completely different sense of tonality. Um, I have a number of different equations where you can view the triads that it's creating. So here again, so modulation is taking my input, the frequency of that, and the sum and the difference of that and the carrier frequency. So you get a completely different, there's all sorts of different out triads that you can get, and so we'll look at that later on. So after your growls, you kind of get into these bell tones, and in order to engage that, we're going to have to move the high switch over. So what's interesting about this stage 
in the, the carrier oscillator is you can start to play with the square wave in a way that like if you had an expression pedal set up to trigger the frequency knob it's going to sound like a car changing gears as we move up let's try that again so there's a different idea of like creating there again using the rate knob to create a sense of in time with the band um, so other than that we have like the, the shimmers, and that's way up here in the upper register of the frequency knob. What I find interesting about this state is that you can use this LFO to kind of create a, a sweeping effect underneath whatever you're playing. Now the mix is important. One of the most important things that I've figured out is like by listening to different bass players that are using it is the mix is really important because you don't want to abandon your role as a bass player. So say we're getting back into it. down low there's still quite a bit of fatness in there and you can support your role another thing that I've found is that I really like the sound of it being uh, out of tune by a whole step there's this a nice amount of wobble to it so like tuning it to a seventh or a two is really a lot of fun. Alright, so what we're looking at here is a spreadsheet I've created. I'm going to label it A so that you can find this one in particular and follow along. Uh, another way you can look at it is we're going to be starting on C3, which is your open C string or your fifth fret on your G string, and working your way up an octave, playing a C major scale. And then we've tuned the carrier pitch of the oscillator, um, to a G, an octave above the top of your scale. And you can see the hertz values of each of these listed here. Um, so what happens is as we move across, you'll see signal A, which is the addition, and I've taken the carrier and the tonic, or the pitch that I'm playing, and added them together, and that value, you can see it move all the way up and down the scale. And then you can also see the pitch that is associated with that. And so since it's math and it's not necessarily a harmonizing pedal or working inside of a key, there's intonation. And so you can see the amount of outness or in tuneness um, here. Um, and then this is the range of motion. Like here we've got a range of motion of an octave being played by the bass, whereas the signal A, the addition, is a major second, and the signal B is a major third. Um, so again, as we move over, you'll see signal B, which is the subtraction of the carrier uh, or actually of the your base minus the carrier and it gives you these values in Hertz here and again it'll give you pitches um, and the distance that is traveled uh, in Hertz and in intervals uh, again intonation and when you read it all the way across what you get is a triad well right here we get a dominant chord we have C3 E5 and B flat 5 so you get a 1 a 3 and a 7 being triggered off of inputting a 1 and a five and then as you move down you get all these different triads that are being formed and if you reference the bottom you can see the tonality of having it tuned like this you get pretty much a chromatic scale minus the tritone and a flat six um, and so this is just another way of trying to view the dissonance that's being created by a pedal and being able to control it and understand it on a thorough level so the next segment of this is going to be uh, drawing 
drawing these intervals, what I'm going to do is treat this dodecagon and we're going to tune it with C on top and we're going to move chromatically clockwise around it and then we'll draw the shapes of the triads and then we can kind of get an idea of the geometry of the tonality of tuning it like this. Now there's a number of different spreadsheets that you can find that have uh, different tunings and different keys uh, to get some a, a perspective on uh, the versatility of viewing it like this. Uh, yeah, that's everything. All right, so what we're looking at is a dodecagon. It's got 12 sides, just like our chromatic scale. And you can see that I started at the top with C and moved all the way around chromatically. Um, so what I've done is I've put spheres around the pitches inside of the key of C and then drew lines to give us a shape of that tonality. Okay, so the next step, what I did was I put a blue dot where we tuned the carrier pitch, which is here. And then you'll see orange spheres indicating the pitches that the ring modulator generates that are outside of the key. Um, what I just noticed recently, I find it kind of interesting, is that the, the only pitches that we don't have out of the chromatic scale are on either side of the carrier pitch. So I don't, I can't explain it, it's just an interesting observation and I'm gonna have to do some more looking to see if it's a consistent theme. Okay, so now what I wanna do is if you look back at the spreadsheet A, um, on the far right hand side, you will see triads with pitches and I'm going to draw the triads and we'll see that it takes shape with these spheres. So I'm gonna do one for you right now. and then. So from C to E, from E to A sharp, and from A sharp to C. So what we can see now is that we have a dominant triad, well, without the five. Yeah, and so I'm gonna fill this out real quick and yeah, I'll see you on the flip side. So here you have a kaleidoscope of the tonality that the ring modulator generates. What I've done is it's color coordinated. Um, you'll see the spectrum in the scans uh, that uh, will reveal the, the order of the chords and how they move. Um, that way you can just identify, oh well, when I play an E with it tuned to G, I get E, D sharp, and A sharp, which is this yellow triangle here. Um, yeah, so it's really not that hard to to generate a palette like this to draw from and it, it's what to do with it is up to you. So everybody, that's everything. I hope you found the information enjoyable and uh, applicable for you and your creative adventures. Um, I'd like to say that I'm not the only person thinking about these things out there and there are a lot of wonderful resources out there. Uh, I will source those at the bottom of the page. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank Paul for helping me do this. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope you learned as much as I did. Peace and love.